утро походить. Good morning, Page Dice. I'm very grateful to the organizers for the opportunity to present, and I'm grateful to all those present on this early Saturday morning, eager to listen to a pretty technical presentation. So I will be talking about uh, backup tools and the security issues they present, also the vaults we've discovered, so ways of exploiting them, and other technicalities. I'm Alexander Karotin, I work for Kaspersky. Labs, uh, where I do security analysis of various automated control systems, industrial control systems, if you like. I also get to participate in uh, uh, various uh, external uh, projects such as pen testing or reverse engineering. And what I'm going to share with you today is a case of a pen test gone bad. I think somebody said this last year that a bad pen test, uh, as seen by the pen tester himself, should be external and the scope should be relatively small. There should be not too many hosts and not too many ports so that you don't really know where to go and what to do in order to make this pen test good. So I get such an invitation to participate in external pen test uh, one uh, autumn day, where in fact there are only two external hosts. Uh, one is a Windows host running MS Exchange, and another one is uh, running a web application. So it's a uh, Linux. Host. Having spent some time on uh, both hosts, I decided to check uh, what else uh, may be running there in the landscape. So I found on port uh, 10,000 and Windows a service that uh, would uh, deliver a binary banner upon connection. And it also was clear that it's an NTMP protocol. It was applying its own internal sector and it was taken pretty correctly. It was also delivering a timestamp and a message type, which uh, did show that uh, we were talking to NDMP. And NDMP stands for a network data management protocol it is used to support data backup over the net. It's an open protocol. It exists in several versions, and the latest version, number five, dates back to mid-zeros. I see people taking photos. I'm not sure you need to do that because the presentation will be uploaded, will be publicly available. So the latest version, like I said, goes back to early zeros or mid-zeros, and this specs uh, can be found on SNII website and also there you can find a client to deal with the uh, NDMP devices. Packet structure is uh, pretty simple and every packet will consist of a header and a data field and the key field in the, he in the header is the message code which uh, defines the type of uh, the message that is sent and it also explains how the rest is going to be parsed and the specification lists about uh, 50 NDMP messages. Some of them you can see in the slide, so it supports authentication, obviously. It also supports uh, various uh, physical devices and physical storage devices. Uh, in particular, we're interested in messages that would uh, tell us something about the system. And I'm talking about get server and get host info. So we wanted to know how to interact with the service and you know, which commands to use to activate so the easiest thing to do was to use NMAP scripts, in particular NDMP version and NDMP FS in full. But rather than simply sending these commands for enumeration, it was, it was not entirely clear what else we could do. And if we wanted, which we did, to get uh, more cozy with the service, we had to look for some other solution. And that potentially could be NDMP client from SNIA, I'm sorry, SNIA website. It's actually a good one. It supports only 70 NDMP messages available. However, the problem is that NDMP itself in its specs also supports proprietary commands uh, from the vendor, obviously. And if we want to send uh, those proprietary commands, it means we'll need to do some more tweaking. And it's also Solaris and Windows uh, compliant. So that 
of would require some tweaking. So we decided to grab Python and code on Python some minimalistic commands that we would need to interact with the service, which is exactly what we did. So one of the messages returned an authentication error message, which suggested that obviously there was some authentication in place there. And the second command returned some service information, vendor data, version data, and also the list of authentication protocols supported, which was not listed in the specifications, so we're guessing they're also proprietary. Having googled for this information, it became clear that we were dealing uh, with a Veritas backup exec agent. No, it's a data backup presentation, so you must have guessed already what Veritas does. It has client-server architecture, and agents are installed on servers uh, that need to be backed up, and these are cross-platform agents, and they are managed by master server or a central server uh, over the NDP protocol, obviously, and uh, backup copies are stored in media servers. And it is the kind of the agent that we discovered in our pen test, and interestingly enough, it was exposed on the internet. Like I said, uh, this software is pretty old. First versions appeared in early 90s, and uh, the name of it changed over time, uh, which may be confusing. So if you try looking for version 9.3, which is what uh, was uh, told by the agent, suggested that it should date back to early zeros. Uh, the problem is that the version of uh, the installation and the version of the system are actually not really related. So it it took some time for us to realize that revision 9.3 corresponded to version 20-something of the backup exec. So we were able to learn uh, the name of the software, the name of the version, uh, we knew which protocol it was running, specs were open, however, we didn't have the client, which we had to develop on our own. There were also extensions for proprietary commands. Something that uh, we haven't seen yet, but obviously we will run into them sooner or later. There are also some proprietary authentications, and naturally some NDMP commands would require authentication. So we had to go into it, and we started our favorite uh, disassembly environment. We're interested in three things. Uh, the translator, so to speak, of NDMP messages, the way they do authentication, and which other proprietary commands of Veritas may be using and how they can be leveraged. Now let's start with the structure of the agent. So the main executable, which is uh, B, B remote, it listens to port 10,000, and then it uh, invokes several libraries as shown in the slide. And then they will start the NDMP server. NDMP SRV lib contains a, a list of uh, all the handlers of NDMP messages. Every handler has got an ID for messages uh, and uh, the function for the handler and also some additional parameters uh, such as uh, authentication required or not to perform a particular command. Then NDMP run function is invoked from NDMP com library, uh, which is responsible for network interaction. Then it sends the handler table and the main handler, NDMP connection handler, which is going to parse the header. It will also grab the message code out of it and identify the handler that we need and invoke it. For a network function, they use a class called bsocketdll, while for general func functions such as uh, file management or registry, they use be class. And there are also several leaps both based on OpenSL. I'm not entirely sure why they need two. I'm guessing that uh, the crypto is uh, uh, is an artifact of the older version. 
This is the handwriting table, and the version that we analyzed had about 200 of this. Compared to 70, you can find in the official specs, which means that 130 proprietary uh, messages were developed by characters as such. And uh, the names are pretty vulnerable because they tell you so much, like execute command, file read, file write. So all we had to do was just uh, send the command and say if it's impactful or not. The problem is that all these commands required prior authentication. So backup exec used uh, various authentication tools, but right now they're only supporting three. One is SSPI, only available for Windows, some mythical SHA authentication, and this standard authentication, BE2 or BWS2, which is used for by their server to connect to the agent and do whatever they do. Well, SHA, like I said, is uh, pretty mysterious here because it's not entirely clear, you know, where it's used or uh, by whom. It, it seemed like a rudiment, like an artifact from previous versions. So, authentication worked like this. As a client sends this uh, auth etter authentication message suggesting that it wants to use uh, SHA authentication, and agent uh, generates a 64 by challenge and returns it, then the client uh, uses uh, this challenge to to calculate uh, hash using also its uh, private uh, 32 by key and then it sends back to the agent that the agent collects uh, the B32 secret from its uh, DBA ID and uh, calculates its own hash and returns an error code. And how is uh, DBA ID stored, which is the secret source? On Windows, it's stored in the registry uh, for line in on Linux, it's a rel CFG, and uh, it's a remote something for Linux. A sample of uh, the field for DBID shown here in the storage, it's uh, encoded with DBA64, but effectively it will be SHA256 hash, which is calculated based on user password. Now, what we see here is that regardless of uh, which user we send, everybody gets the same password. What we also see there is that, unlike the standard uh, BE authentication, where impersonalization of the flow is going to happen, nothing like this happens here. All commands after authentication will be run with service command uh, service rights. The most interesting thing was that uh, DBA1 field was in fact absent by default from um, the storage. So when the agent was trying to calculate the control hash, it simply puts uh, 64 zero bytes in front of the challenge and would then run its computation, which means that any network user could easily request SHA authentication, get 64 challenge at uh, 64 zero bytes in front of it, set it to the agent, which sounds like a classical authentication bypass. And we get very happy and we believe that now we shall be able to send our common execution but then we run into a TLS issue. And the problem is that authentication needs to happen over TLS tunnel. If there is no TLS tunnel, everything will be rejected, no authentication will happen, and that's uh, not a regular TLS, it's a DLY TLS, uh, which means that the client I'm sorry, there is a requirement uh, regarding a uh, signed cert. So, we need to learn more about TLS at this stage. In order to install TLS connection over NDMP in uh, port 10,000, Veritas has got a command called SL Handshake, which does not require authentication. And the data field structure is uh, shown over here. You will see that the key field is the first one, TLS message ID, which uh, explains what the objective of this packet is. In the agent, you will see four subtypes for the SSL handshake message. The first one is a test cert. When test cert is dispatched, it is done to check if it's possible to connect with a current root certificate. 
Соответственно, агент... And it's uh, actually written in uh, the cert ID field. So it connects uh, to the file system. Uh, the system will return to if it does have the certificate. So note that uh, the cert ID field is an array, which means that you can actually send four IDs of root certificates, uh, which helps us assume there can be several root certificates at the same time. Next one is the connect message. And this is the one used to initialize TLS connection. Effectively, it sets the agent into a mode for accepting TLS messages. So after SSL handshake connect, the agent will be expecting the classical TLS hello message in order to fire up TLS session. Most interesting one are message ID 2 and message ID 3 messages because they enable us to update the certificate on the agent. The way they work is that Nuster server sends a CSR request. In response, the agent will generate a key pair and uh, will uh, return you know, P in PN form its signed request. Server signs it and returns it together with the root certificate and metadata where it lists its IP, its host name, so that the agent can identify who actually sent all this. And after that, they send SL handshake connector command and classical TLS. Note, however, there are no checks happening here. Nobody will check who actually signed the agent's certificate. It doesn't really matter if the agent had the root certificate installed or not. We can easily request CSR, generate our own root cert, use it to sign uh, the agent, send it back, and then have the TLS running with our root cert. Now the puzzle seems to be clicking together. Remember how we started. So we have the sent EMP messages that can be leveraged to execute commands, to read files, to write files, but they did require authentication. So we started checking authentication and uh, we found a way to bypass it. That required uh, some management of TLS, which we were also able to do. So we do everything I've uh, listed in the reverse order and we have our impact. So uh, once we've uh, bypassed TLS, we can bypass authentication and then we can do command execution. Note that backup exec isn't it exec, it's remotely executable, which is like bullseye. So we dispatched, we sent all those things, we reported them to vendor in 2021. After a long communication, the vendor agreed with some of these ideas. They did not uh, recognize that, uh, you know, this installation of root certificate remotely uh, bug was not a bug, but a feature. I'm not sure if uh, this is their adamant position. It may be available even now. Uh, good thing is that they have removed SHA certification. So starting from version 22, it's no longer there. Initially, this uh, POC was available on Python as an NDMP client. Uh, However, about 18 months after the patch, uh, we decided uh, to publish it. So it's a Metasploit. It uh, was uh, redesigned on Ruby. It has been published since then, and it does support uh, Linux agents as well as Windows agents. The main difference is uh, when you drop the payload for Windows agents, there will be a command called uh, write file and open file, which means that, you know, you can drop the file and then uh, fire it up with command execution. That's not available on Linux, so... Uh, we had to deliver the payload through Bash. So what are the remaining indicators of compromise? Uh, they obviously include the certs. Uh, there will be three file certificates, uh, certificate files established, the root certificate, the agent certificate, and the agent key. And they will all be stored on Windows and on Linux in the data directory. A name format is shown here. So first four bytes coming from hash, 
And that's a real number. Also in the storage, which is, uh, you know, either in the registry or in the RAL CFG file, you will see the metadata, such as the IP address and the host name, which you need to indicate when you install the agent certificate and the root certificate. That was good. What's nifty about it is that they are not checked in any way, so you can write whatever you like there. If you want, you can, for example, uh, overwrite an existing root certificate coming from backup exec, or you can indicate a random IP, a random house name, and install it uh, next door, so to speak. This way you'll have two. And logs will be stored on Windows and on Windows alone, if I'm not mistaken, and only if create debug log option is set to true. I have not been able to find such logs on Linux, and in any case, uh, logs will only be generated in console mode. As we were running our repentas, we saw versions that uh, seem to be vulnerable but not exploitable. For example, maybe uh, they had DBID value, which means that the password was uh, other than default, or in some cases they had older versions, which means that, you know, you know we couldn't exploit it. In industrial networks, we also found some older x86 versions where command format was uh, at least partially different. Summarizing all this, we decided that, uh, well, we had to update our PSC. We realized that uh, switching TLS off and supporting older x86 versions would be good things to do. And this is something that we've done on uh, Python already. And uh, we're going to update our Metasploit module soon. So when uh, password uh, is indicated, that is, with DBID value is uh, Maintained. Yeah, brute, brute forcing becomes a possibility as well because there, there are no thresholds for incorrect password entering. Moreover, when you enter this uh, DBID uh, password, quote unquote, and if you do it through the graphic interface before it's stored into the registry, the agent will try to authenticate locally on the Windows machine using the same credentials, which means that DBID is going going to store valid credentials for the Windows machine if you're using uh, the GUI, which means it can be brute forced with impunity because your account will not be blocked. I've tested it locally on the virtual machines, obviously. So, you know, I did rock you and the service would continue running, so logs here are a proof of that. Now let me summarize for backup exec. So all versions early than 21.2 are vulnerable. Exploitation is easy because uh, you don't need to meet any additional uh, conditions. So no binary magic is involved in it, making it pretty reliable. And you do get privileged access pretty easily. So our pen testing practice has shown that if you see an invulnerable backup exec, this must be domain admin. There are so many agents creating a large attack surface. And then you know you can get persistence. I'm sorry, you can you can enter like five different domains and collect credentials there, or you know even better, you're running on domain controller which needs backing up, and then you get access there. So coming back to my story of a bad pen test. So you may remember that the agent was running on exchange, so we're able to dump credentials there. So we we. So we're able to turn a bad pen test into a good pen test by doing that. Well, Veritas has got more goodies, not just a backup exec. Another product they have is Net Backup. Another backup tool, as the name suggests, and they position it as an enterprise solution. While a backup exec, according to their website, is an 
SME solution. All these are different uh, solutions. They use different services and ports and protocols, but in terms of architecture, they are identical. So there are agents running on servers. They need to be backed up. There is a master server running all these agents, and there are media servers where backup copies are stored. And this naturally got me thinking that if not the vulnerabilities themselves, but at least the nature of these vulnerabilities may be the same there. So in 2020, guys from Arbus did a bit of research and they found like 30 vulnerabilities of uh, different criticality in uh, different components of net backup. Just like with backup, exactly in my opinion, agent vulnerabilities were most interesting because there are many agents, they create a large attack surface. <coughs> And moreover, they can easily be exploited uh, for further lateral movement. And interestingly, they easily supported a uh, kind of uh, by design RC on agents if the master server has already been compromised. If we haven't done that, this is not an option, or is it? The thing is, there is a command that a master server can send to a client requesting that the client goes to a shared drive and executes an arbitrary network file there. You just need to ask nicely, you know? So the way it works, it must your server sends the right command. I'm not going to list the specific technical details because we're still communicating with the vendor and they have already recognized some of the vulnerabilities, uh, but, uh, you know, they are still having a hard time recognizing the others. So message server, I'm sorry, uh, the server sends the command, the agent uh, grabs the IP, tries to resolve it through the DNS server. If it fails, it returns an answer. If it is resolved, it goes to the register and uh, checks uh, the host name versus the control value for uh, the master server in the registry. If they match, he goes to the network drive and executes the exit file there. Obviously, the issue here is around authentication as well. So if we can successfully spoof the name of the master server, then we will be able to execute a file remotely. For example, if we send a command from a node that does not have a PTR record on the DNS server, then res resolution will happen over LUNAR or NBNS, which means it can be spoofed. It needs to be an L2 segment for sure, because it's LUNAR or NBNS. And to no probability, we will not have access to L2 segment where these agents will be running, which means that we first will need to hack uh, at least one of these servers on the network. Then the IP address of that server should not have a BTR uh, entry in the DNS. Most importantly, we need to guess the name that we are going to spoof. But do we really need to guess? Maybe we already have access to the agent and we can check the registry for the name. And uh, what guys from Airbus have found can be quite handy there. The alternative, though, is to resolve the scope. Master and BMS. And try finding there some like uh, and backup MSTR and uh, net backup master and so on and so forth. And hope we are successful. What are the difficulties here? By default, popular tools uh, such as responders, for example, they are not spoofing these records. Uh, so we actually had to develop our own script that would sniff traffic that would look for the required. Uh, LNMR requests and generate the responses. And we didn't want to limit ourselves to L2. And obviously, we can spoof DNS, right? So besides the regular network spoofing attacks, we can also use the DNS update technique. That would require any Active Directory account with any rights, really. Uh, it does require visibility for DNS controller and the name. 
добавить там. So DNS update enables us to add or delete records from the DNS server. By default. Используется там security. What's used on ID? Которые должны быть подписаны. Как это обходится? The security DNS updates and they need to be signed. Можно запросить TGS ticket у. What's the bypass? Well, we can request a TGS ticket from KDC and then use it to request TK from DNS server. You know, by default, uh, TKs should be issued to everybody and then use TK to sign all DNS updates and, uh, and then use it in the reverse DNS zone. An alternative is to use LDAP in order to add a PTR record. The logic here is just the same. You request a TK, uh, a Ticket for LDAP this time. Then you aid for like uh, five minutes after the object has been added uh, for the sync to happen. And then, you know, DNS server has been updated. The potential, I mean, there is no big difference between uh, these uh, two techniques. In any case, uh, the required AD object will be created. Toolwise, you can use uh, PowerMat for both techniques, and on Linux, you may want to use. Um, uh, DNS updates uh, tool. Now, IOCs uh, will include the logs. At the application level, you know, I tried to maximize the verbosity in my booth, but uh, it wasn't very successful. It's either because uh, my contraption was bad or, you know, they don't really log it. Now, for Windows logs, they do get created if we're using DNS updates. Then, obviously, an AD object will be created, and that can be tracked. Let's summarize for NetBackup. Now, thanks again to the great Airbus team, they found so many vulnerabilities. Note that all components of uh, NetBackup are very much intertwined. So you hack any host with any agent running, and then you pretty much compromised all the nodes where NetBackup is running, just like that. Uh, now, what we have found is the agent uh, network-facing vulnerability, which uh, enables remote code, ex code execution. It cannot be exploited uh, anytime, uh, everywhere, but it is a pretty common thing. And the issues we found with backup exec, as you can see, do apply to net backup. I'm talking about the Logitech surface uh, due to multiple agents, lots of inbuilt factors. So you don't really need to disassemble the binary code. There are lots of commands you can easily execute. And you may start thinking already that this problem should apply to other vendors, not just Veritas. Now, why did I tell you all this? Now, you may have noticed that this uh, vulnerability for backup exec was discovered back in 2020. It was resolved in March 2021, two years down the road. Wherever we see backup exec, we see has not been patched. So you can easily get uh, domain admin rights in a couple of moves with backup exec. It's a bit more complicated with net backup, but not that much. Really. Other products? They easily have the same issues. For example, in March 2023, a similar issue was discovered for VM backup service. So credentials can easily be intercepted in plain freaking text. So bad guys are already leveraging these uh, CVEs. 
which obviously means we need to be more public about those issues so that infra owners install their updates. It doesn't really matter if you are running Veritas or some other solution. I mean, if uh, you're, you know, running an industrial network, it may be more difficult to update your system. But if you're a corporate, for God's sake, update everything. And the more we do good pen tests, the faster, hopefully, service owners will get their act together. Let me also make uh, some conjectures about backup tools in general. Lots of hosts uh, making for huge attack surface. Moreover, components tend to be very much intertwined. You hack one node with one component of the backup solution, the whole infrastructure is compromised. Authentication issues, like I said, usually you have lots of agents, and uh, when you go for convenience, you usually compromise safety and security. Numerous functions built into the agents make life for the hacker so much easier. All you got to do is pull the right rope and generate the impact that you needed. And the final issue, and it is uh, potentially less common than the others, is uh, getting or not getting admin rights. But in many cases, you know, the systems uh, will be associated with uh, service accounts. So recommendations obviously include uh, patch management. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's sick. If you have not patched a system like this, which enables, you know, privilege escalation and uh, RC, in, you know, just like that for two years. So be good, 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 good boys and girls. Auditing and logging. Absolutely, you need to be tracking what's uh, happening in your system. You know, you got to log everything so that SOC people have uh, food for thought. Mitigations. So for specific services, you may want uh, to uh, do, say, DBA ID values. For net backup, you may want to, for example, disable NBNS and LMNR uh, resolving, I'm sorry, or you may want to restrict DNS node access rights. Uh, and there are some general mitigation recommendations, uh, for example, endpoint firewalls still make a lot of sense. Make sure that access to service port on the agent is only available to the right kind of server. Uh, An equally rational thing to do is uh, to remove agents from the perimeter. As of March 2023, only, I'm sorry, varied as a backup exec instances exposed to the internet totaled over 8,500. And you can uh, check on your own which of them have been patched and which haven't. And lastly, I do believe we need to pay more attention to this issue. So our practice has shown that this attack vector is uh, pretty feasible. So let's look for vulnerabilities together. Let's do more research. Let's make reports. Let's uh, share our knowledge to make the whole world a more secure place. I also want to thank Sergey and Radu, who have been helping me with this study. Uh, you know, with them, we have been doing it all. And these are the links I used as I was preparing preparing for this presentation. So uh, these are very dispatches. So these are links to great Airbus research and other good studies. Thank you very much. Hello. Is that better? Yeah. Thanks for this uh, the roller coaster of a presentation. I've got four questions. How much time were given for the pen test? 
But the external bad tests were given two weeks. So by the end of the second week, we hacked it. So you found the valve by the end of the second week. That's right. How long did you talk to the developers? Did it like take you two years for them to have it patched? No, certainly not. For backup, exactly, it was like three months. Uh, Say it was patched in about three months. Uh, what about what about the other products? He did mention two years somewhere. Two years it took us to publish our POC. Okay, are you the people behind the VM vulnerability? No, no. That's that's not me. Thank you very much for this presentation. Why would you only consider the host level for detection purposes, uh, not the network traffic? That's a good comment. You're absolutely right. Uh, we should have uh, analyzed network traffic as well, but we did focus uh, sort of exclusively on what we could do to the host. I'm just talking about the endpoint. Uh, you're absolutely right. So we could have easily, I guess, uh, use the network resources to get a compensate and mitigate. I'm just trying to say that if we study the protocol and the overall stats, we can see that a sudden spike of uh, NDMP requests, uh, you know, would be a trigger for the SOC, would it not? So, I don't think that IDS can take care of that uh, but uh, if you have say nta it would be pretty easy to identify such a zero day attack thank you Thank you so much. Great work. I understand that you've seen this uh, product so many times in your pen test. Have you got some internal stats on the probability of, uh, you know, finding a product like this? You know, whenever a company is using a backup, like VM, versus various well i'm not that big on uh pen tests but you know in in my experience one in two backup solutions is veritas so for the second product you talked about you said this uh, vulnerability with updating uh, the record in the dns server how, like how does it work the real server made this record can you just overwrite it just like that when you add a ptr record and it's already there it's only the account that established it on ad that can overwrite it but we need to create a PTR record for the IP address that is mounting the attack. So we can just add the IP that we need, which means that clients, I'm sorry, let me put it differently. The IP from, uh, from the link is used for resolution. Yes, the PTR record will contain our IP address, but the host name of the NetBackup master. And this is how it's uh, resolved by the agent. Yes, it's reverse resolving. Gotcha. Hello, thanks for the presentation. Authentication is Authentication and session for Veritas backup, are they different? Uh, think uh, NTLM relay, like if we authenticate, uh, like can we be using the same authentication to execute code? 
таких каких-то impersonating somebody else in other words well cookies as such are not sent as part of the session so you've established a session and you know this changes the state of a flag to true I haven't tried that but I think I, I understand what you mean I haven't tried this myself I think you can give it a shot theoretically speaking it should be possible client response authentication которая на это страдает я просто потому что как бы не чекал и не могу утверждать сто процентов что all i'm trying to say is that i have not checked it so it's difficult for me to make any conjectures here спасибо Okay, if that's it, thank you so much. We got prizes for the best questions. We got this very positive suite. And we have three prizes. Who would you like to... Oh, I think we had three questions. Or did we have more? I'm sorry, I completely forgot who asked questions. There was a gentleman over here in the first row about Relay. And you're absolutely right. That's something to be explored. All oh, right. There was a DNS question over there. Uh, uh, and at the very beginning, there was a question over there.